Um, I would like to, for those of you who are joining us for the, for the first time this week, I'd like to introduce um, our guest speaker for this week, Dr. Clifford Mani. Um, and as I've promised, I'll give you little glimpses of him um, from day to day. Dr. Mani is a native of Liberia in West Africa who became acquainted with the ugliness of the human character at an early age. He was given away as a child to an abusive mother, to an abusive woman by his grandfather. And he ran away from that cruelty and that violence and he became homeless. And as he wandered the streets alone and without shelter, he frequently wondered if there was anyone who truly loved or cared for him. And that wonder, that query, was answered years later when he learned that there is a man called Jesus who loves him so much that he died for him. And he found out that there is a God in heaven who claimed him when he was yet unaware. He discovered the Holy, the Holy Spirit who provided comfort when he didn't even know it. The Holy Spirit gave him comfort in the form of a, a vendor, a market woman who once gave him food and in the person of a German mother who shared her son's clothes with him. But best of all, the Holy Spirit provided comfort in the person of the Northeastern Conference Bible instructor who offered him Emmanuel and eternity on a New York City number two train by giving him a tract that led to his baptism and to his membership in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it is through that journey that we are here today. Dr. Mani, we thank God for you and we pray that you will minister to us whatever it is he has put on your heart this morning. The stage is yours. Thank you so very much once again, my brother. Uh, Mikoa, is that Mikoa? Mekwa. Mekwa, okay. Thank you, Mekwa, for that uh, beautiful thought about me. Let us go to the word. Um, <clears throat> let me read Mark chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. Before I do, I'd like to welcome all of my members who have logged on. They've been, some of them been here since we started. And a dear friend of mine also, uh, Dr. James Bodo and uh, Pastor uh, uh, Christian Collet out of Minnesota. I want to thank you for your support. Okay, let's go to the word. Verse number three, truly I tell you, Mark eleven twenty three. 23, truly I tell you, if one of, if, if anyone say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Verse 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it shall and it will be yours. Whatsoever you ask in prayer, believe that you have it and it will be yours. And the King James said, whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe that you have already received it. Our subject for tonight is perceive to possess. Perceive to possess. In this story, in this story, Jesus Christ and his disciples have passed a pathway earlier, like a day earlier, on their way to the temple to go worship. They passed, while they were walking, they felt hungry, they saw the fig tree. And during that time, that, during that season, it was on the season for fig tree, for fig tree to actually uh, uh, have leaves or to have even um, um, fruit on them. But from a distance, they saw this fig tree have blossomed with green leaves. 
And so they just assumed that there were fruit on the tree. And when they got there, eager to pick some fruit and eat while they were hungry, and they got there to their disappointment, there were no fruit on the tree. And Jesus immediately cursed the tree for, for uh, uh, tricking them into thinking that there was, a, there was a fruit. And they passed by, they went to the temple, they worship. on the way back the next day, they reached the same very site where that tree was and to the amazement of the disciples, the tree had died from the root all the way up to the leaf and the tree was completely dry up. And the disciple was so excited that Peter, uh, yeah, master, master, look at this. I mean, they were so amazed. Look, the tree that was alive yesterday, you just cursed it yesterday. Look at what the tree looks like now is dead, Peter said. And Jesus is amazed and Jesus is aware of me. What's the big deal here? Why are you taking this to be so, so such a big deal? I mean, believe in God, Jesus said. If you believe in God, then Jesus began to lecture them. If you believe in God, you can say to this mountain, move and be cast into the ocean. The mountain will obey you. And whatsoever you desire in your prayer, when you pray, just believe that you have it and it shall be done. It will be yours. Now, when we read this passage, it's easier for us to read it and say, I believe. And then we pray whenever we pray, even though we pray and we say we believe. But when we pray for, we don't usually possess it. And we wonder why. I told you on night one that God has placed all his creation under our feet. On night two, I told you that we were included in all that the possession of God. We were included into the sonship and the daughtership of God, which means everything God possesses belongs to us. That means we can call things and claim whatever it is we want. God has set his economy that way. However, I also told you on day one that the enemy of our creator, the devil, that Satan, the devil, he came and he fooled us and put us for 4,000 years in a prison and he built a limited war around us. And so for 4,000 years, we grew to believe that we were creature of limitation, when in reality, we are creature of limitless possibility. Nothing we put our minds to, to do, we cannot do. Whatever we put our mind to. Now, putting on here in his book, I was trying to remember last night, is think and grow rich. Think and grow rich. He said, whatever the mind can conceive, and believe it can achieve. So what is Jesus talking about? This is the same thing Christ is talking about. Whatsoever you desire. So let's unpack this word desire because I think when we finish with it, you will understand what true prayer is. True prayer is not about coming to God and asking him and, and, and pleading with him and doing all of those things. And then in the end, sometimes we, we hit and miss and we don't get anything. Now, first Second Corinthians 120 said, all the promises of God in Christ are yea and in him, amen. There is not wait until tomorrow or just a little bit. No, 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 no. He said, all the promises are yes and amen. That's it. So what is the reason? Why is the reason why we don't get things done the way it should be done? Now notice the word in the King James is, Whatsoever you desire. A desire is something deeper than just a want. A desire is something that comes from within you. If you want something, if you, you desire to get or to possess something. And how does that happen? Desiring of your heart, when you desire something, that means true prayer is the ability to be able to see that you may possess. All right, this is what I mean. Before you get what you're praying for, you need to visualize. We don't teach that in the church, but this is how God set up his universe. Remember, now we are supposed to be the creator. We're supposed to see things happening. We were told last night 
if you remember, I know I was going a little too far for some of you last night, but last night I did say, when you look at Second uh, uh, Peter, Second Peter, I believe it's 1, 3, it said that all the things, all things have been given unto you pertaining to life and godliness. Nothing is left out. And then I also quote that to you, Hebrew, not Hebrew, uh, uh, Ephesians 1, 3, Ephesians 1, 3 said that you have been blessed with all spiritual blessing. Now, what does that mean? Everything that you and myself see, I've been telling you for the past two nights, everything that we see with our eyes, once upon a time was invisible. It was nowhere around. When God created Adam and Eve, there was no house. Nothing was around. But God made everything. All that we see now was here, but it was not physical. It was not in a three-dimensional world. God left it to us to be the one to bring it into the three-dimensional world. So when somebody thought about building a house, the concept of how it came into the mind of the person in the building. Somebody thought about getting a bicycle, they get a bicycle. Somebody thought about having a car, they got the car. Somebody thought about drive, I mean, having a plane, they flew, they, they created a plane. Somebody thought about having a cell phone and all of these things, once upon a time, were not there. In fact, the ability that we have now where about 290 of you are watching me on this platform right now as I speak. About, about five years ago, maybe uh, seven years ago, this was not available, it was invisible. Somebody thought about it. It is whenever you become conscious, consciously aware of something that is needed in this, in this three-dimensional world, it will eventually come. So that's why God gave us imagination. Our imagination is a preview of what is to come in our lives. Oh, this is the reason why most people do not understand the power of imagination. Your imagination is the God showing you what is yours in the future. So when Jesus said, whatsoever you desire, when you, when you pray, believe that you have it, let's go to Hebrew 11, uh, one, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet here is not physical for us to see. What does that mean? Here's what it means. You see, hope, hope goes ahead into the future with by way of your imagination, hope goes and hope sees something spectacular, something that you're supposed to have, you're supposed to possess into your life. So, so hope gets it. And then what faith does is faith begin to celebrate that, that, that possession that is yet in the future that hope just grab onto. Faith begin to celebrate it right here in the present as if that which hope has seen in the future is happening right here in the present. Many years ago, a few years ago, a friend of mine was going to Liberia to my home, my birth country. And a friend, when this friend was going, my niece, who I'm supporting where they're going to college, she called me and she said, Uncle, could you please send me any old smartphone that you are not using now? I told her, I said, well, I could do it. But the problem is my friend is leaving tomorrow morning. I live in New York. He lives in, in uh, uh, Maryland. So there is no way for me to get it to you. However, I'm going to ask him if he has a phone that he's not using, if he will bring it for you immediately, my, my niece started praising the Lord and celebrating. And then I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't tell you, say, I was going to send the phone. I said, I will ask my friend. But she said, nevertheless, she praised God for it. And guess what? My friend said he looked everywhere. He did not find the phone. And so he went took the money that I gave him, took it to her. While he was there in his hotel room, unpacking his suitcase, the thing dropped. And not only did the phone drop by itself, but the phone was still neatly packed into the case with all the accessory that comes with it were in there. What happened? My niece celebrated. She was giving thanks to God before she received it. In other words, so when Jesus said, whatsoever thing you desire, when you pray, believe that you have it. Here is how believe word. Believe is when you see it visually in your mind, in your imagination, 
and you begin to, to possess it, you begin to act that you already have it. You see, when we were placed into the cage, I told you about the first night, when we were placed into that cage, we developed all kinds of behavior that, that suggests that we were limited individual. So in the cage, we learn to say thank you after the fact. In other words, if you promise to give me uh, uh, $10,000, instead of start praising God for the promise, I wait until you gave me the $10,000, and then I start being excited. So what Jesus is saying, do the opposite. Do the opposite. You try to visualize what it is that you want precisely the way you want it. When you visualize it, then you ask yourself, what happened if what I'm seeing now in my imagination? What happened if I possess it? What kind of emotion would I exhibit? What would I do? How would I feel? And so if the answer is, when I get that $10,000, ooh, I would be so excited. I would be so excited because I have it. If that is your answer, then when you see it, even though you don't have it yet, you need to allow the emotion, the emotion of joy and gladness and happiness, that emotion need to come on now with a gratitude that go with it to be thankful. And we are told, Jesus is saying, when you do that, then creation which is already under your possession will do whatever it does to bring that thing into your three-dimensional reality. It's not about fasting or how long you fast. It's about your ability to be able to perceive. If you're praying for somebody to get to be killed, then you need, what does it mean? Lord, I beg you, please heal this person. That's not enough. You need to specify what healing means to you. You need to be able to visualize the person jogging, the person laughing, the person doing the things that healthy people are supposed to do. You need to visualize that. Even though the person is lying down in a hospital bed looking helpless, but in your mind, you're seeing the person being robust and the person being excited and doing the thing that happy people do. And the Bible says if you are able to do that and able to see that, you will, your prayer is answered. Then immediately you can now say, thank you, Jesus, for the answer to my prayer. You begin to thank God for the answer. A young man walked up to me once when I get through preaching at my church. He said, pastor, he said, um, you know the greatest thing I want? I said, what? He said, I want to get a, a raise on my job so I can make at least $75,000. I said, why? He said, I want to be able to buy my own home, to buy my car, to live with my own young man, then I will get married. Then I said, let's assume that everything that you want, that you think the $75,000 a year we gave you, let's just assume you go to work on Monday and you get that in your possession, then what? And he said, oh, then I'll, I'll do what I want to do. Then I said, after you do all what you want to do and all done, then what? Then he said, well, then I will do this and I will do that. I will do this, I will do that. And then eventually he said, well, after everything is done, I will be at peace and I will be joyful. So I told him, I said, that is your heart desire. Your desire is not the $75,000 a year. You only desire $75,000 a year because you think $75,000 a year is going to bring the peace and tranquility and joy that you really see. Your real heart desire is for you to be at peace and joyful. That's your desire. So Jesus said, whatsoever you desire, believe that you already have it. So watch this now. So if your desire is peace and you think it's the money that will bring it, then Jesus said, you need to start receiving the peace right now. And you need to start acting as if you are joyful right now. You need to start being what you believe the 75,000 I will bring to you. And the moment you start doing that, what's happening? All creation say, wait a minute. Clifford Manning really, really believed that he had the 75,000 dollar raise. We had to make it happen. And everything bent towards making it happen. Several years ago, 2004 to be exact, I was so crazy and I said, you know, I said to my wife, I want to get me a Mercedes Benz. So I took a picture 
I went and to the to the dealership and got a picture of of an S class. That's a hundred plus thousand dollar car, and put it on the wall. And every time I just say I will get it. Now we're not praying the way I'm teaching you right now because I was begging God to give it, not knowing that everything that I need is already mine. All I had to do is to claim it. I didn't I didn't know that. It took me a year. It took me a few years before the Lord started teaching me this, and then I started. Practicing it was not difficult. It was not hard. I mean, it was harder for me to to visualize because I was never trained to be that way. So I started to imagine and I started to create a, 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 a what do you call it vision board and I put the thing because the Bible said you have not because you ask now and when you ask you ask amiss. That means you're not asking the proper way. That's why you're not getting. I'm talking to prayer group people here today and so yeah, Jesus now. So I. For a long time, after a while, I started seeing Mercedes S-Class all around me driving. And then after a while, I started pretending that my Toyota that I was driving was an actual Mercedes Benz. And I started driving it. And I started believing it that I'm in a Mercedes Benz. I started having the attitude of having a Mercedes Benz. And because of that attitude, guess what happened? Eventually, by 2016, I was able to possess one and by the way, the Lord has already paid for it as I speak to you. I am telling you, true prayer is not all about just shouting and yelling and fasting and doing all of that. It's about being able to know clearly in your mind. Jesus said, where two of you are in agreement with something, it will be done. What that means? Some people, because usually when you hear two of you, like myself and, uh, and Brother Mikhail, it's like, that's the way we are. No, 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 no. What it means, your mind and your heart. When your mind and heart are consistently in agreement for something. Because a lot of time when we are praying, our heart is not in a prayer. When we are praying for something, our mind is not in it. And sometimes the mind is in it, the heart is saying it. But then we don't, and we'll talk about that later on. So when the two come together, because the Bible said, as a man thinker in his heart, as a man thinker in his heart, in 1990, they brought, they discovered that there were neuron, 40,000 neuron cells in the heart. Neuron cells, neuron cells supposed to be in the brain. And they got curious and they tried to figure out what this is about. And then they figure out that their heart can think of its own with independent of the mind. That is the reason why whenever you want to do something, the only place you can go to get the right answer is your heart. Because when you go to your heart, your heart is a singular uh, uh, organ. Your brain is polarity organ. It's left and right. They debate with each other, but your heart tells you don't do it. And a lot of us, a lot of time in our life, when those things don't get done, guess what? After a while, we regret, we say, boy, I should have followed my gut feeling. That is your heart you are talking about. So Jesus said, whatsoever thing you believe, whatsoever thing you desire, if you desire it, that means you can visualize it. If you translate it, say, whatsoever you see in the future and accept as if it is here now with you in the present, you will have it. If you can see it, you can have it. If you can perceive it, you can possess it. This is what this test is saying. So to my prayer group here tonight, I bring this simple message to you. Prayer is all about being able to visualize and see clearly what you want. And once you see it, then you can be thankful to God for it. Tomorrow we'll be talking about uh, something else uh, along this, maybe we'll pick it up so that you will see what I'm talking about precisely, and you will see how Jesus himself did it. That's what prayer is. So as you go into your prayer room in a few minutes, I want you to think about it. And I want you to start practicing this, because the next time I come back to worship with you people, I want to hear all the testimony, and I'm telling you, it does work. It does work. It does work in the area of healing. It does, and when, when you master how to do this, then answer prayer is no longer miracle. It's now a way of life. Now you can pray intentionally and deliberately for what you want, and you can get off your knees knowing that what you pray for, you already have. May the Lord bless you, Father in heaven.
thank you for letting us know tonight that in order for us to possess it, we must perceive it. And Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.